oral bacteria have been linked with multiple adverse health related conditions, which is what we can see here. So starting with uh, inside the mouth, they've been linked with dental caries or cavities, primary endodontic infection or dental root infection, periodontal disease or gum disease, uh, dry mouth, but also dry eyes, so Sjogren's syndrome, and then oral bacteria have been linked with conditions outside of the mouth too, including ather atherosclerotic plaque, pneumonia, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. So with that in mind, how can we optimize oral bacterial composition? So to me, the first step is quantification. So with the goal of quantifying oral bacterial composition, I used Bristle. And if you're interested in quantifying your own oral bacterial composition, uh, you can use my discount link, Conquer, Ager, Conquer Aging 15, and that link will be in the video's description. So what's my oral bacterial composition? And I've listed most of it here. This is 98.3% uh, of my full oral bacterial composition. Uh, just there wasn't enough space on the slide to put all of it, but you can see that the lowest relative abundance, so how much of each bacteria uh, on, a, on a scale of 100% is in the sample. You can see that that goes down to 0.2%. So, um, so very low amount. So we've got 1.7% that's missing. If anybody's interested, uh, which is missing, just leave a comment. I've, I'll be happy to uh, post that information. So first, I want to know, are there are any of these bacteria linked with oral and or systemic health? You know, it's great to get the data, but what does it mean? Is it good or bad? So first, in terms of bacteria, oral bacteria that have been linked with uh, health, oral health, there are two main genera, uh, Neisseria and Rothia. So in my uh, saliva, this is a saliva sample, I have a decent amount of both of those genera uh, with the sum of about 53% for, for, for both Neisseria and Rothia in my salivary microbiome. So is 53% for just these two bacteria or these two bacterial genera, is that optimal for oral health? And Nobody knows. Uh, that's the honest truth. There, there's a paucity of studies on how the oral microbiome changes during aging and its association with all-cause mortality risk. Uh, so that data just doesn't exist yet. All right, so how does my oral bacterial composition compare with bacteria that have been linked with oral and systemic health? So this data that we just showed earlier. So first, starting in the mouth, uh, I'm going to start with one bacterium, Streptococcus mutans, which has been linked with uh, cavity formation, so dental caries. Now, in my salivary sa uh, sample, there was no Streptococcus, uh, Streptococcus mutans in my data. So the question is why? Now, I make a homemade mouthwash that contains xylitol, so that may be one reason why I didn't have any of this bacterium in my sample. So let's take a look at that data. So the growth of this bacterium, again, Streptococcus mutans, is limited in the, in the presence of 1% xylitol. So here we're looking at levels, in vitro levels of uh, Streptococcus mutans, and specifically it's the strain 2366S1. So the C are, is control levels of this bacterium without any xylitol. And then we can see increasing levels of xylitol in the, in the media, and then what happened to growth. So when compared with the control sample that had no xylitol, and when compared with 1% xylitol, 1% X, as shown by the green arrow, we can see that there was a 76% reduction for streptococcus mutants in the presence of 1% xylitol. Now, what about xylitol's potency against other strains of this bacterium? So just because it works against one strain, there may be many strains, and if this is the only strain it works against, then it, why use xylitol at all? So here we're looking at the inhibition percentage for, the, for xylitol against other Streptococcus mutans uh, strains. And specifically, there are five. The one I just showed, which is 2366S1, uh, but then four other uh, Streptococcus mutant strains as, uh, strains as shown by the black arrows. And what we can see is that in the presence of 1% xylitol, there's a 61% to 76% uh, growth inhibition of this bacterium in the presence of 1% xylitol. So with these data in mind, I make my own homemade mouthwash containing 1% xylitol, uh, and that's one gram of xylitol per 100 milliliters of water, which then raises the question, what else is in the mouthwash? So to uh, help address that, let's take a look at what happens uh, with an increase in oral acidity, which is a major contributor to tooth decay. So here we're looking at on the y-axis at plaque pH. So the plaque is a sticky substance on teeth. And as a function of time, starting at time zero, uh, after exposure to a glucose rinse. So for the person who has active cavity formation after uh, the glucose rinse, after exposure to the glucose rinse, we can see a rapid decline in plaque pH to below 5.5, all the way down to about 4.5. 
So why is a pH, an oral pH of 5.5 important? Well, that, that's the quote unquote critical pH and there, that's a high risk for cavity formation when the pH drops, the oral pH drops or plaque pH more specifically, drops below 5.5. So for the person who has active cavity formation after the uh, glucose rinse, there's that rapid decline to below 5.5 all the way down to 4.5. And then you can see that they spend a significant amount of time below 5.5 as indicated by the area under the curve, AUC, the red region. And then unfortunately, the person, a person who has active cavity formation also has a slow recovery to above 5.5. Now, in contrast, for the person who has inactive cavity formation, after the glucose rinse, there is a small dip below the pH of plaque pH of 5.5, but then there's a rapid recovery away from that zone. And for the person who's resistant to cavity formation, we can see that after the glucose rinse, the plaque pH never ap uh, approaches 5.5, and there's also a quick recovery uh, after that initial dip from a pH of around 6.8 to around 6 to back up to 6.8 pretty quickly. All right, so with this in mind, to limit oral pH drops below a pH of 5.5, I add sodium bicarbonate, which is a base. So I basically al alkalinize, alkalinize, <laughs> uh, alkalinize my mouth. And for that, I use one gram of sodium bicarbonate per 100 milliliters of water. And I, and I chose that amount because the uh, salt concentration of blood is 0.9%. So this is 1% sodium bicarbonate. So it's essentially uh, close to isotonic with plasma. So one gram per 100 mils of sodium bicarbonate also is in the homemade mouthwash. All right, so what else is in the mouthwash? And I raised that issue because P. gingivalis has been linked with adverse health conditions both, both inside and away from the mouth, as we can see by the red arrows for atherosclerotic plaque, for pneumonia, uh, arthritis, periodontal disease, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, and also uh, root primary endodontic infection. And I put how much of that that I have for each of these conditions. So I have 0.2% of my total levels of salivary bacteria are P. gingivalis. Now, that's not a lot. I'd say that that's trending towards very low uh, uh, amounts of P. gingivalis. And one reason for that is because also in the mouthwash is peppermint oil. And there weren't any pretty pictures from this paper, but in this paper, Meyer et al., 1993, and I'll leave that paper in the video's description, peppermint oil inhibits the growth of P. gingivalis. So also in the mouthwash is two drops of peppermint oil uh, per 1,000 1, mils per, per liter. Now, is that optimal? I don't know. Is that causing my relatively low levels of, of P. gingivalis? I don't know. But um, it's in the mouthwash and it's a correlation uh, for having relatively low levels of, of this bacterium. All right, to summarize for what's good for my oral, my salivary microbiome, I don't have any streptococcus mutants, which has been linked with uh, cavity formation. I have relatively low levels of P. gingivalis, which again is associated with a whole bunch of adverse health-related conditions. And I have relatively high levels of Neisseria and Rothia, which have been linked with oral health. So what's not good? So I have relatively high levels, or at least greater than or equal to 0.2% of bacteria that have been previous link, previously linked with adverse oral and or systemic health. And I've listed them here in red. So starting with atherosclerotic plaque, I have two of these bacteria, including Tanarella for Scythia and Streptococcus sanguine. So I have 2% of my total bacteria are, uh, are related to, I guess, atherosclerotic plaque. I have bacteria related to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, I have back four bacteria that are linked with uh, dental root infections, and then I have three bacteria that are linked with lupus. So uh, to, th to me, that's not sufficient. I don't want to have any bacteria that have been linked with adverse health-related conditions, both in the mouth and outside of the mouth. So how can I reduce levels of at least some of these bacteria, if not all? Now, for that, there's, as I mentioned, there's very little information on the oral microbiome, the salivary microbiome especially when compared with the gut microbiome, and even fewer studies on randomized controlled trials for interventions to improve the oral microbiome. So defining what an oral microbiome is, uh, very few papers, but then even less, how to optimize it. Now, one of the papers, fortunately, it, uh, for how to optimize it is an in vitro study that's I've, I've uh, shown the title here, Nitrate as a Potential Prebiotic for the Oral Microbiome. Now, to define some terms, a prebiotic is a substance that feeds already existing bacteria, which enables their growth. So how can nitrate act as a prebiotic for the oral microbiome? So starting from a diet rich in nitrate, and that includes green vegetables, beets, carrots, and other foods, uh, those foods are nitrate rich. So the direct effect is to increase oral levels of nitrate, NO3 minus, in the mouth. 
Now, the indirect effect is after you eat nitrate-containing foods, that increases the plasma concentration of nitrate, which, is, which then gets concentrated in the parotid gland and other salivary glands, which then release nitrate into the mouth. So how does nitrate impact the oral microbiome? So in this study, they looked at, and it, again, it, it's a very small study, but again, there is very few data that exists in this subject, uh, unfortunately. They used saliva from 12 quote-unquote healthy donors. They didn't define the age. It was only men. Unfortunately, they didn't use women. Uh, they didn't identify uh, BMI or diet or any other factors. So quote-unquote healthy donors from 12 people, 12 men, was incubated with nitrate. And what was the effect of this nitrate exposure to saliva in vitro on the levels of oral bacteria. So on the y-axis, we're looking at the levels of nitrate relative to the controls that were not treated, controlled saliva that wasn't treated with nitrate. And then on the x-axis, we've got how each of the uh, individual oral bacteria changed after exposure to nitrate. And that's after five hours in light green and darker green after nine hours. So first, note that there were significant increases for the oral health-related bacteria, Neisseria and Raffia, uh, in the presence of nitrate. So you can see uh, those three, uh, actually it's the unclassified Neisseria too, all of them being higher or uh, higher at five and nine hours with the exception of Raffia, which was higher at five hours but not nine hours. Now, nitrate exposure, saliva, to, uh, exposing saliva to nitrate wasn't just uh, you, there wasn't just an increase for nit uh, uh, these three bacteria, bacterial genera. It also reduced, quote unquote, bad bacteria, at least bacteria that have been linked with caries and halitosis. And more specifically, each of these green arrows, uh, I had uh, I had levels of, I should say, I, I was going to say relatively high, but who knows how high is bad. I had levels of these bacteria that have been linked with um, um, deficits in oral and or systemic uh, health. So note that for each of these bacteria, Streptococcus, Valinella, uh, Porf Porphyromondus, um, Fusobacteria, and Leptotrichia, uh, after exposing the saliva to nitrate, each of them was significantly re reduced, which is good because I want to reduce the quote-unquote bad bacteria while increasing the good ones. Now, two other bacteria or bacterial genera that I had in my data that have been linked with uh, oral and or systemic, uh, poor, poor oral or and or systemic health were Tanarella and Trepanema, and although uh, they weren't significantly decreased after nitrate exposure, note that the trend is downward. So maybe it didn't work in these 12 subjects, but maybe it could work for me. But nonetheless, there's enough positive data in this study with an increase of the nitrate-reducing bacteria, the quote-unquote good oral health bacteria, and a decrease in the quote-unquote bad uh, oral health bacteria. So I think it's a good idea to increase nitrate as a, as a means for optimizing my own oral microbiome. So how can I increase oral nitrate? Now, with the goal of optimizing oral bacterial composition, since we see that a diet rich in nitrate will increase uh, oral nitrate, should I eat more nitrate containing foods? Well, I'm already on a high nitrate diet. Now, here are many foods that I eat uh, in my diet and it isn't a comprehensive list. It's missing things like collard greens, which I eat a lot of, um, but it's, it's got most of the nitrate uh, contained in my diet. So we're looking at nitrate content of each of these foods in milligrams per 100 gram of food. And then note that I track my diet every day. Uh, and I should say, uh, shameless plug, with chronometer, and if you're interested in a chronometer discount link, that will also be in the video's description. So when looking at the, the dietary period for my last blood test on May 9th, through my, last, my, my latest blood test on July 11th, that period, I have my average intake for each of these foods, and then we can calculate the nitrate content that I'm eating from each of these foods on a daily basis, the average for each of these foods on a daily basis, by multiplying the nitrate concentration of these foods by my average intake. So we've got my nitrate intake for all those foods, and when we sum them, we can see that my total nitrate intake uh, per day, on average, is almost 1,900 milligrams, almost two grams of nitrate per day. This is a high nit relatively high nitrate diet. So I, it's going to be difficult for me to increase more beets. I'm already eating 200 grams of beets per day and 200 grams of mushrooms per day, 300 plus grams of carrots per day. It's going to be tough to go further with nitrate-rich foods. So as many of you know on this channel, I generally don't supplement. I try to get it all from food. But I do support, I do you know, promote uh, as a part of my approach, targeted supplementation. So this is a situation where I think adding potassium nitrate to my homemade mouthwash um, may have some benefit. So then the question is how much nitrate and how often? Now note that this study was a, an in vitro study. So whether the in vitro concentration that they used is something I should replicate is unknown. 
And especially there aren't any published randomized controlled trials, RCTs, that use a specific amount of nit nitrate to optimize the salivary microbiome. So with that in mind, I think a fair amount to use is two grams of potassium nitrate per 1,000 milliliters. This is a 32 millimolar concentration, which is five times the concentration used in the in vitro study. But again, I have no idea. Uh, uh, this is just where I'm going to start. I can always titrate it down or even titrate it up based on uh, what my results will be in for, uh, future salivary micro microbiome experiments. So next up then is how often should I use this mouthwash? So here we're looking at salivary nitrate levels and conversion to nitrite after nitrate exposure uh, in saliva. So saliva that was exposed to nitrate, how much nitrate was left in the sample after a period of time. So immediately after exposing the saliva to nitrate, we can see a big burst in the concentration of nitrate in the sample. But then after five hours, almost all of it was consumed probably by the nitrate reducing bacteria, Neisseria and Rothia. And that it, uh, after consuming it, they convert it into nitrite, as shown there, there's, a, there's an increase in nitrite at the five hour point in conjunction with the decrease in nitrate uh, at the five hour point. And then after nine hours, there's no more nitrate remaining in the sample. So what does this mean? This suggests that I should use the mouthwash once every five hours, as most of the nitrate will be consumed after five hours and nine hours at the latest. Um, and then no rinse after using the mouthwash, because if I use the mouthwash and then rinse, I'm probably washing away all of the nitrate, but also xylitol. So I won't get that prebiotic effect for my salivary microbiome. Whereas if I mouthwash and then spit, whatever's left can be used as a prebiotic, potentially to increase or uh, increase the good, quote unquote, good bacteria or reducing the quote unquote, bad bacteria. All right, so then that raises some, some questions. Will levels of nitrate reducing bacteria, more specifically the Neisseria and Rothia, further increase? And levels of those, those quote unquote bad bacteria, which are associated with a whole bunch of adverse health related conditions, will they decrease? And to test that, I'm going to again use Bristle. Uh, they sent me another kit, so I'll retest probably in a, a less than a month. Uh, I want to give my oral microbiome a chance to uh, uh, assimilate to the nitrate in my mouthwash. I, I Honestly, I don't know how long to go. It could be two weeks. Could, it could be a month. But I think a month is a fair amount of time to uh, do the experiment. So yeah, I'll use Bristle. And again, that link will be in the video's description if you want to get a discount on your own oral microbiome. So stay tuned for that video update. That'll be coming sometime in the near future. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.